when lockdown ended, I did what a lot of people who were lonely at the time did. I went on the dating apps. And this woman messaged me and she said her name was Kay, K-A-Y, and all the pictures were at a distance. I was using a fake name and unclear profile pictures just in case somebody would recognize me. She said she was an academic and that she studied Middle Eastern politics. And we met. We sat down and I asked her, are you a spy? Which I thought was a very funny joke because uh, why would anyone be an academic in, in the Middle East in Australia, right? So I was like, ha ha, I'll make her laugh. She didn't laugh. She was jailed for 10 years for spying. Australian academic Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert heading home. Freedom after more than 800 days in prison. Kylie Moore Gilbert is on her way home. He saw a newspaper article which had a picture of me in it about a week later. I panicked and then I sent a message saying, I'm so sorry. I'm embarrassed that I didn't realise who you were. I'm a journalist, I should have known. So can I make it up to you with dinner? I was a bit hesitant because I thought, oh, I'm going to have to open up and, and talk about prison now. And it was all, it was pretty fresh for me still then. And I was sort of hoping to fly under the radar a bit longer with him first. I've seen the darkest side of human nature possible, and that's marked me. I didn't necessarily think I'd get a second chance like this. Sammy told me that he was a comedian, so after a few dates, I went along to see one of his shows. But I didn't tell him I was going, I just sat in the back of the audience. I wanted to see what kind of comedian was he, if he was funny or not, you know, what he'd be talking about on stage, just sort of doing my background research. My comedy, like pretty much everything else I do, keeps getting me into trouble. Yeah, I kind of started off doing that in Pakistan. And then when I came to Australia, I kind of found the same problem. Things are bad, things are very expensive, everyone's broke. I, uh, I know everyone's broke because I took an Uber to get here and my Uber driver was white. <laughs> I've never seen that shit before in my life. There's nothing out of bounds for Sammy. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was hilarious. It was really clever and really smart and it made me like him even more. Then I got excited. I was like, drive me, white slave. And then... <laughs> Then I got angry because I was like, taking a job away from a hard-working immigrant? How fucking dare you? Mate, I flew here. You grew here. Fuck off. <laughs> I was born into a Shia Muslim family in Pakistan. We were moderate Muslims. I liked writing and, and I liked writing, being paid for my writing, and journalists get paid to write. Um, and so I, I became a journalist. Around 2003, I'd started doing comedy with this improv comedy troupe. And the reason I joined it was because there was a really attractive girl in it uh, who I wanted to get to know better. And, and I got two things out of being in an improv troupe. One was I got with Ishma, and we were married a year after that. And then the other thing I discovered was I really love comedy. Uh, effigies are basically straw figures, really life-size, that the Muslims pull out whenever anyone says that we're a violent people. And we pull them out and burn them to show how non-violent we are. In about 2009, 2010, I started thinking about a new satire show that I wanted to create. It's a news weekly was born. President Zardari managed to find jobs for almost everyone in the PPP. While Pakistanis have a very wicked sense of humor, the people in charge don't share the same sense of humor, especially when the jokes are directed at them. You know, I'd get death threats. I got a bullet in the mailbox, or, or there'd be letters and, and graphic illustrations of things that they would want to do to me. Ishma started saying, we need to move abroad. I was like, I was very reluctant, until the day Anya was born. <laughs> Reach for the camera. Not the, on your the reach. 
And so we started applying for immigration. I was born just north of Sydney. And at the age of nine or 10, I moved inland to Bathurst. I think I had a pretty standard childhood, really. My parents were together, regular nuclear family, three kids. Love me, Nana. Carly's always been special. She was a very intelligent girl, and she had this inner drive to always do her very best in everything. I took several years off between high school and university because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I ended up uh, backpacking around the world. I really loved the Middle East. There was this amazing degree at Cambridge University called Middle Eastern Studies, and miraculously I got accepted. I did my year abroad in Israel, and I met my ex-husband on an academic program. Ruslan and I stayed together for the final year of my studies at Cambridge, and then following that, we moved to Australia together. Uh, we subsequently got married in 2017. We got a letter saying, you have been accepted to live in Australia. But we have to spend the first two years living and working in a country town in Western Australia. We ended up in a town called Northam, between Perth and Kalgoorlie. Uh, it turns out stand-up comedian and satirist aren't in high demand in Northam. Uh, and my particular skills were quite useless there. The pressure, the uniqueness, strangeness of Northam and being isolated, which was really, really frustrating. I think my mother probably paid the bills since she was the one working. She worked in a detention center. She was a counselor there, and my dad was probably in charge of the main household because he was a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> Watch your step. Wave bye-bye to the teacher. It was frustrating, and I felt lonely at times, and, and I felt like, what have I given up to come here? But I got time to be a parent properly with Anya for the first time. I learned how to cook, I learned how to clean, the skills I needed in life. It was a hard adjustment and I made it significantly harder by doing what I always do, which is I made jokes about the situation. My wife and I, actually what happened is we moved to Northam, um, the town of Northam, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Um, the reason being we love uh, ducks and uh, pregnant teenagers. <laughs> it's just, uh, we can't get enough of them. Those jokes got printed in the local newspapers, and all of a sudden, everyone in Northam uh, really hated me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anya. We ended up living in Northam for four years. Melbourne was this thing in our head that had become a fixed goal. It was why we were going through the Northam experience. Blood. Blood. Yeah. And so in 2015, November or December, we packed up our bags and finally moved to Melbourne. By the end of 2017, I felt that my life was coming together. I had finished my PhD at the University of Melbourne and secured a, a great job there. She was married and, and buying a house, which was a very grown-up thing to do. She had a job at Melbourne Uni. Things were looking good for her. It was a wonderful time for her. She was starting to reap a lot of her hard work, you know, it was all full into place. In August 2018, I travelled to Iran for an academic conference and the trip was only supposed to be two and a half weeks. In 2018, Iran was one of the most repressive authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, backed up by a group called the Revolutionary Guard Corps, who are a kind of a state within a state. I said to her, is it safe, Carly? She said, oh, yes, Grandma. The university have invited me. I have done some research to see if it's safe. And uh, 
It doesn't seem to be a problem. She'd done research trips in the Middle East before, so it didn't seem like a very unusual thing. She was excited about it. A couple of days before I was due to depart Tehran, I had an inkling that all was not right. First, it was the hotel receptionist where I was staying. He'd come to me and said, Kylie, some men came to the reception asking for you, asking if you were in the hotel at the time. And he told me these are very bad men. The day I was supposed to leave Iran, I took a taxi to the airport. When I was approached by several plainclothes men uh, wearing black, who told me in broken English that I am under arrest and I need to come with them. The first time that I thought something might have been amiss was I sent her a, a text message and she didn't write back. A couple of days later, one of my contacts at Melbourne Uni sent me a message just saying, look, have you heard from Kylie? She was supposed to be on a plane and she hadn't boarded. It became clear to me that I was in deep trouble and I was transported to Evan Prison. I was thrown into solitary confinement. The first cell that I was put into was a two and a half by two and a half metre squared windowless box. There was lights on 24 seven. I spent the first few days in kind of a manic fashion, imagining all sorts of horrific physical torture and other um, techniques they might use in interrogation. I would ultimately spend a total of 12 months in solitary. The whole point of solitary confinement is to break you. It's to break your spirit. It's to make you give up everything you know in the interrogations um, because you can't stand the mental torment of being in that cell alone for 23 hours a day. In a way, I would have preferred them to come and physically torture me than subject me to that day after day after day. You just go insane. Your, your brain cannot cope. Eat pumpkin. Eat that whole piece. You going out afterwards? Mm -hmm. Are you? I don't know. I think so. Yeah, you can with coffee that movement. Come on. We tried setting up a home in Melbourne briefly, Ishma and I, and it became very obvious to us very quickly that our marriage was done. Sam and I had grown very much apart and were actually living two separate lives. I remember they got into arguments a lot, but I just thought that was what every couple did. But I came home from school one day, and they were like, Anya, we need to talk. We're getting divorced. And I remember just being in complete shock about it. I was unhappy for about a couple years, I think, about three years. But slowly, I started getting used to it. You know, after moving to Melbourne, I started looking for work. I was no longer in a country town. I had no excuse now. I had to find a job. And so I banged on the only door that I always wanted to bang on, which was the ABCs. And then in 2018, uh, I got lucky enough to be offered the co-presenter role for ABC Radio Melbourne's breakfast show. Sammy Shah, good morning. Good morning to you, Jacinta Parsons. How are you? I am well indeed. I got to talk to Melburnians about their lives and learn more about Melbourne. And, and, and Melbourne's a city of immigrants. So I felt it was fitting for an immigrant to be a presenter in Melbourne. Around the time that I, was, I started working at the ABC, I met someone and we started dating. Uh, she became deeply involved in my life and, and Anya's life as well. Um, and uh, we got married. She was a lovely human being. And I thought, OK, if you're the one seeing my dad, then I'm happy with that. After about nine months, I was brought to court to hear the bill of indictment read out. I received 10 years for the crime of espionage. The idea of me as a spy it was just ludicrous. My response was really to laugh because the alternative was to scream and cry and break down and I'd done enough of that over the months to become numb inside. Her mother came up to see me and she told me what had happened. And she said, but mum, the government say they're negotiating and um, we don't want any publicity. So don't tell anybody. 
And, and of course, that was just terrible. It was difficult having to lie to people and say, oh, yeah, she's good. Oh, yeah, she's really busy. I haven't seen her for a while. Yeah, that was hard. I understood from my family that the government had advised that my situation be kept from the media. I wanted my situation to be public. I wanted people to know what had happened to me. I therefore, you know, started trying to leak information about my situation out of the prison. These letters I successfully had smuggled out of prison. As you can see, they're written on very, very small, fine sheets of tissue and written in very small handwriting. It was quite risky to leak these letters outside of the prison. In fact, I was once beaten by prison guards when I was caught trying to smuggle a letter outside. The Revolutionary Guard wanted to recruit me to work for them and it became a war of attrition between myself and them as to who would crack first. I am very proud that I did not give in to those demands. There was a lot of suffering and punishment meted out to me as a result of my refusal. In the end, I think the diplomatic pressure became so severe that they had to accept that they wouldn't recruit me and focus instead on negotiating something in exchange for me in a prisoner swap deal. Freedom after more than 800 days in prison. Kylie Moore Gilbert's ordeal in Iran over, but not before a forced statement in Farsi. I came to Iran two years and three months ago. I visited a few Arab countries and a Zionist regime. Until we left Iranian airspace, I just couldn't fully trust that I was actually going to be released. My captors had threatened that they could turn the plane around midair and force it to land again and had said all sorts of horrible things to me upon my departure. <laughs> I moved to Australia knowing that I just wanted to survive and I'd, I'd survived and with gusto I'd, I'd had a job at the ABC. I had a wife and, and, and I restarted my whole relationship with every love and marriage and money and, and one month it was all gone. Uh, what else happened during lockdown? Um, oh, my wife had an affair. <laughs> That came as a complete shock to me. I broke down. I was traumatized from that experience. I still am, still am sort of. Uh, this was my, this is my second marriage, by the way. I've, I've been married be once, once before. Um, I've been married twice now because I'm not a fucking loser. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that ended at the same time as the marriage was my role at the ABC. The ratings weren't where they were hoping they would get, I'm assuming. Honestly, losing the job was one of the worst days of my life. I, I was really upset, I was heartbroken because I loved doing radio, I loved talking to people. Um, and not being able to do that anymore really hurt, and it hurt for a long time. So I was now unemployed and being cheated on and also in debt. And uh, that was, uh, you know, we call those the difficult times. I just saw him go through a very rough spot, really dark spot. His mental health was just breaking. He just looked like he'd lost his faith in everything and everyone. And my heart was broken. My daughter's heart was broken as well. And things were not looking good. Australian academic Kylie Moore Gilbert is back on home soil. There will be, a, no doubt, a long road back to recovery from the mental ordeal that she has faced over the more than two years she's been languishing in jail. It was a really surreal experience to be home. So much had changed. I had changed dramatically. When I got back to Melbourne, I was slowly, I guess, trying to rest and recover from my ordeal in re-establish normality. I learned that uh, my husband hadn't been faithful to me whilst I was in prison. 
and that our marriage had come to an end. The betrayal was compounded by the fact that I knew both of them. My family didn't know about my former husband until I did. It became apparent to all of us actually on the night of my release. There was no heartbreak. My heart had already been decimated by everything that had happened in Iran and this was minor compared to what I'd been through there. I navigated the divorce and it came to an end quite quickly and I was grateful for that, that I could move on with my life. Several months after my release, I joined some of the dating apps. I saw Sammy's profile on Hinge. I wasn't aware who he was. I was dressed as Muammar Gaddafi in my profile photo. I did not know my father was ever on a dating app. Even the thought of that just sounds very weird and disgusting to me. But I knew somehow he wouldn't end up being alone forever. It seemed a bit soon, but on the other hand, yeah, if you've had like two odd years of your life taken away, why would you wait any longer? There was an immediate connection. After we got over the awkwardness of my first joke, um, the, and the connection was there because we both had been cheated on by our former partners, and that leaves you with a particular kind of hole in your heart. Like, it's a, it's a very particular hurt. There was also this, this intellectual connection. I heard a lot about Sami's experiences in Pakistan, and that resonated with me a lot, given my experiences in Iran. He was very well read, very intellectual, which I liked as well. Our relationship would have progressed a lot more slowly, but about three months after we started dating, COVID lockdown happened again. And um, we spent that whole period basically together. And I had spent so much time alone in prison, I didn't want to be alone again. In a way, we healed each other. Yeah, of course you will. The other thing has vegetables in it, and God forbid you eat those. Do you know? I like what I like. Mm -hmm. Early on, Sami had mentioned to me that he has a teenage daughter, uh, and he didn't want to introduce her to me for some time. One day I found a picture on my dad's desk that he drew of this woman. And that woman was Kylie, and she was my dad's girlfriend, and I wasn't happy with that. I didn't trust my dad's relationships. I thought he couldn't see red flags when he dated people. I had been with Kylie long enough that we were serious, and I think a year at that point. Um, and then I introduced her to Anya. After I met Kylie for the first time, I still didn't like her very much. I thought, okay, this is very new. This is very sudden. I don't want to get hurt again. Oh, look at the jewelry. Like but later on, after I met her for the fifth time, I was like, okay, I still don't like you, but I might be getting used to the fact that you're here, so I might as well deal with it. Okay, hey, look at these. These are so pretty. Yeah. Anya's got Sammy's nature, warm-hearted, friendly, kind, and gives people the benefit of the doubt. She was invested in trying to make it work, as was I. I always wanted children, but I was arrested age 31, and I had to contend with the fact that I might be in that Iranian prison until I was 41. And so when I was freed, I knew that this was a priority for me. I was closed off to it, initially. It took me getting to know Kylie a lot better before I realised that I wanted to have a kid and I, how serious she was about it as well. Sammy's in his 40s, I was 35, so neither of us were spring chickens. So that they can support me. And Kylie said, we might have to do IVF, and I was like, I'm Pakistani. Like, you don't get population numbers like ours without being reliably able to impregnate on time every time. So, yeah, pretty much nailed it right out of the gate. <laughs> you know. <laughs> My father looked at me and said, we need to have a talk, I need to tell you something. And I said, oh wait, Kylie's pregnant, let me guess. It was so soon. But 
as soon as I found out that the baby was a girl, and I just got so excited. I saw Leah coming out, <laughs> which I'd never, I've never seen that before. In Pakistan, you, you get kicked out of the room. It was amazing. Uh, and I really, truly had that thought of like, what an idiot. Why was I not going to have this again? And now I have a sister and I love it. From that moment to now, I've, have, I've just been happy. I was able to tell my friends in Evan Prison that I was pregnant. It means a lot to me that they would share in my joy. This cardigan was knitted in Evan Prison by my good friend Nilufar Bayani, who heard that I was pregnant with Leah. I hope Nilufar herself will be pregnant one day and, and have a child of her own and that our kids can get to know each other and, and play together. It's very, very difficult for me to let go of my experiences, especially when I'm in touch with the families of many other current hostages from Australia and abroad. I see it in a way as my duty to advocate for these people and to try and push our governments to be better on this score. She does research work to get government policy to change in how they deal with hostages and hostage diplomacy as a policy um, to create awareness about it. It's become her raison d'etre. I actually think I've learned important life lessons that I treasure from what happened to me in Iran, in addition to seeing the very worst of, of human nature and human behavior. Hello! I've learnt the importance of human connection, the importance of friendship. Like an emergency button for, for all people. <laughs> fall down the stairs. Yeah. 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 We're we're super excited to welcome Kylie and Leah to the family, so we're pretty pumped about that. Called a dumb phone for dumb senior phone. citizens. I figured it out. I've been divorced twice now, and the trick to not getting divorced a third time is you just don't get married. We don't need to. We're fine. We're, we have an amazing life the way we are. They get along so well. Their personalities mix perfectly. And I'm glad he's found a woman like her in his life. I've never seen Sammy happier. And I've known him for almost 10 years. The Sammy that Kylie brings out of him is the best one I've seen so far. I'm studying at university and teaching at university, which is something I hadn't planned, but I deeply love doing. I spend my time cooking food for my family. And the smaller my life gets, the happier I get, and the more under control I feel of it all. Uh, and I like that. And that's, that's a life that I can manage. My dream is to have a stable, predictable, boring life henceforth, one of small pleasures and enjoyments. I'm so fortunate to have met Sammy. He is such an amazing guy, and Anya is too, of course. So I'm really, really lucky that I've landed in this situation and I've been able to build myself this family together with them. And I'm so, so grateful for it.